Giles Gibson, Washington. From bureaus worldwide, this is Effort. And again, he missed it. Welcome to uh, Tuesday's show. How you doing? You well? It is myself, Richie Allen, live from Salford. Lot going on, lot to talk to you about. It's just me and you. I'm flying solo today. Misha August Tussa. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Oh yeah, it's uh, Misha August Tussa, me and you now for the next hour, maybe I think closer to 90 minutes, I think, today. Alrighty, do drop me a tweet, please, I'd love to hear from you today. And I'm basically going to run down some of the big stories making the headlines here in the UK and around the world today, but also one or two things that you're not hearing on the news. And that's it, really. So there you are. I suppose we just better just crack on in, or on, crack on with it. Yeah, that's the one. Hey, Jean ann Crowley was on the programme last night. Now, you know how fond I am of Jean ann Crowley, one of my favourite people in the world. And I don't say that lightly. Great woman. She was on last night to talk about, among other things, an embryonic thing. Something that's at the gestation period. She's thinking about a manual, a beginner's guide to the new world order, and came on last night and spoke about that very eloquently, among other things. And she gave out her email address, didn't she? And I said, don't do that. (laughs) Not because I don't trust you, dearest listener. No, but you never know what sort of correspondence you're going to get. But the email went out, the email address, and she was asking people for their experiences, thoughts, ideas. And apparently she's been fairly overwhelmed by the response overnight and has received, well, a couple of dozen, if not more, emails from people, enlightening emails, very well-written emails, ideas, contacts. And she's thrilled about it, as am I. So I'm delighted about that. Crowley Jean Anne at gmail.com is the email address. And I did tweet it out yesterday, many a night out. It must be said now at this stage, I've had with Jean Anne and a nicer person you couldn't meet. I say this because Jean Anne is about the most intelligent human being I've ever met, or the most well read, certainly the most intelligent and the most well read. And some people like that, they can be, I don't know, a bit condescending when they throw in a bit of, a bit of poetry, a, a quotation, a quatrain or whatever but never one of the most humble and uh, gregarious and down-to-earth people I've ever met. Wonderful woman. So thanks. Thanks for responding to her in the way that you did. It makes me very happy. It does. Now, Ryan Christian is better known as the last American vagabond. And Ryan was on this program with me a short time ago. And you enjoyed him. I enjoyed him. He was very good. Apparently, there are reports today that his YouTube channel has been deleted. Sadly, this is no surprise. You might remember I did a show. I can't remember. It must have been a few weeks back. I have a couple of, I wouldn't dare say moles. That would be very grandiose. I don't have moles at Google, but there are two people working for Google. And every now and then they keep me abreast of certain developments. And a few weeks ago, I was advised that there would be a pretty massive call of YouTube channels, maybe those who deal with criticism of the COVID-19 measures, maybe those that talk down the need for a vaccine, and those that are critical of vaccines in general, right? And we're seeing it. And I'm sorry for Ryan. I'm sorry that his YouTube channel was deleted. It isn't nice when it happens. It happened to me two years ago. And for a while, you feel a real sense of injustice and outrage because there isn't really anything you can do about it. And for me, it lasted for a couple of days. I was properly cheesed off because it was an outrage. I hadn't said anything, nor had any of my guests said anything to warrant the channel being deleted. And I was pissed off. But look, it doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, Ryan Christian is a good guy. His heart is in the right place. He's a very good interviewer. I like how he gives people time to speak and listens to them carefully. So Ryan will go somewhere else and the lion's share of his audience will follow him there. 
All right, the last American vagabond. Sorry to hear that about him. But it's been a bit of good news. My mate Dave Collins, how you doing, Dave? Love Dave. And Jenny, how you doing, Jenny? You all right today? Dave told me a few days ago about a newspaper, a brand new newspaper, brand new, brand spanking new, and a real newspaper. The kind of thing you can hold in your hand. An actual newspaper. You'll remember. And I think the Waterford Today, which used to be published by Paddy Galler, I hope it still is. Waterford City, Ireland, one of the great cities of the world. Waterford, wonderful, Reginald's Tower. Well, we had a weekly paper, we still do, they're called Waterford Today. It's a paper that is put in the letter boxes of tens of thousands of Dacia men and Dacia women. You see, Waterford was founded by the DC tribe, the DCs, Dacia, we say. Anyway, so this is a free paper. And I love those free papers, right, that come into your letterbox with lots of local news. Now, Darren, Darren is the man behind a new newspaper, a real paper called The Light Paper. And you can go to this website to see more about it, thelightpaper.co.uk. And my mate Dave Collins told me all about it. Two editions of The Light Paper have already been printed and distributed. And you won't believe this, dear listener, but the first one saw 20,000 papers distributed. The second edition, it's monthly now, monthly. The second one saw 50 thousand newspapers distributed and Darren who's been at some of these anti-lockdown protests in London and Darren was filmed singing you can stick your poison vaccine up your arse because he plays the guitar you see and he's behind this newspaper I've been in touch with him I might get him on the program tomorrow if he's about but go to thelightpaper.co.uk and you can follow him on Twitter as well this is a nice development because I've I've read some of the articles And they're well written. I'm impressed now. This is good. And I know if you go to the website, thelightpaper.co.uk, they're looking for people to advertise with him, to bring in some cash for printing costs, but also they're looking for people to volunteer to distribute the newspaper. Now, you might be interested in doing something for the greater good on a Saturday afternoon. You might say, Jesus, I can deliver 500 of those newspapers with a couple of mates. So go to that website, and get involved. It is 11 minutes past the hour. Now, the big story, you did hear my friend Simon Marks on the news there. Even though he can't say this is FSN, I think I'll have to beat the granny out of him so that he can finish the news properly. Talks between Greater Manchester and the UK government broke down, concluded, without any agreement. According to the Communities Secretary, Robert Jenrick, He's accused Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, of being unwilling to take the action needed to control the virus. Andy Burnham had led the regional mayors in saying, as you know by now, we will only consent to Manchester and Lancashire, Greater Manchester, being put into the tier three level lockdown if you give us enough money to pay people to stay home. Okay, and there was a deadline imposed by the government of noon today, Take our offer, said the government, or don't take it, and we will put the Tier 3 lockdown in anyhow. Here's Andy Burnham speaking in central Manchester around about 45 minutes ago. Andy Burnham. £15 million a month was what we costed, was needed to support people across the 10 boroughs that make up Greater Manchester. These would be people who would need support to top up the furlough to 80% recognising that people can't live on two-thirds of their wages. People who are self-employed also with 80% of their income so that they could make ends meet. That was the commitment uh, that we made. So this would cost £90 million to the end of the financial year. In negotiations with the government, we were prepared to reduce our request to £75 million, and we even were prepared to go even lower. 65 million as the bare minimum to prevent a winter of real hardship here. That is what we believe we needed to prevent poverty, to prevent hardship, to prevent homelessness. Those were the figures that we had. Not what we wanted, what we needed. But you could have also told businesses 
and shops, retail, manufacturing in Manchester and in Greater Manchester to open your businesses. Open up. Get your employees back into work. The government is lying about the threat of COVID. The government has screwed you around for months inventing arbitrary rules and regulations. You put all of these social distancing measures into your workplaces. You got all the hand sanitizer and all that crap and all that jazz. You did what you were told and still the government shafts you. Open your businesses, you could have said Andy Burnham. But you're a Muppet, really. He continues. He did to present, prevent all of those things happening. But the government refused to accept this. And at two o'clock today, they walked away from negotiations. In summary, at no point today were we offered enough to protect the poorest people in our communities through the punishing reality of the winter to come. Even now, I am still willing to do a deal, but it cannot be on the terms that the government offered today, because on those terms, I could not meet the commitments I made to people on the lowest incomes. Lovely. to people who are self-employed, to the freelancers in this city who need our support. Now, that was Andy Burnham speaking a bit earlier on. The UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is currently delivering a press conference, holding a press conference at Downing Street, and there he is expected to address the Manchester situation. Apparently Manchester will be put into Tier 3 lockdown anyway. OK, right. Can't say any more on that. It's a nonsense. Well, I can say a little bit more on it. Just a little bit more on it, okay? The, the standoff. It is amazing to me, and I, I did say this a few times this week, but I think it bears repeating, if you don't mind me repeating it. It is quite astonishing to me that some business owners in the North, well, the Northwest, really, they are hailing Andy Burnham as some sort of crusader to save businesses. It's astonishing to me. They're hailing the guy as some sort of hero of the working class. I can't believe it. Listen to the restaurateur Karen Jadov. Karen Jadov or Jadov, I can't figure out the pronunciation. She's in central Manchester, restaurant owner. Here she is talking about Burnham. Have a listen to this. I can bring it up. Here we go. Restaurant owner praising Burnham. I think from our perspective, I'm glad that somebody's finally vo giving the voice that we need for hospitality. We've been in close to tier three restrictions for nearly three months now. So when we come to the 31st of October and there's no flexi furlough scheme left, we're in dire straits if we don't have more financial support. So I'm very, very grateful for the likes of Andy Burnham for standing up for hospitality. Even if at the end of today, he comes out having not really secured a better package for Manchester? Well, let's be honest. Andy Burnham is fighting to support low paid workers and businesses that are struggling to stay open. And these are viable businesses. So that's the point. They're not businesses that were struggling, struggling pre-lockdown. They're viable businesses. So we need the support. Amazing. I mean, they're oblivious to it, these people. It's incredible. It's, do you understand what's going on? Somebody who knows Karina, the restaurateur, please tell her. You'll be saddled, saddled, saddled. You'll be saddled with that debt, your company. You're racking up mountains of debt right now because you're not trading or you're not trading as you normally would. And the furlough cash and the money Burnham wants from Johnson to give to you and to give to others, that will have to be paid back by you, Karina. But you won't be able to satisfy those loans. You'll go bankrupt, love. And as the government is underwriting the loans, we, the rest of us, will have to pay for it. I mean, they're oblivious to this stuff. How do they ever get to run a business? I've seen better business brains on the BBC's Apprentice, to be honest. It's, it's crazy. Karina and her mates should be screaming at Andy Burnham. They should be saying, we want to open, you silly bastard. If we don't open, and if we don't get folks through the door, we're faked. We're gone. He wants to keep them closed, sucking off the government tit, until they're bankrupted. I mean, it's a staggering thing. Other businesses and other business women have a more realistic grasp of what is going on. Let's hear from Kelly in Bridge End. This is a bit surreal, this. Kelly runs an ale and beauty salon, which I've never had any personal need for myself, but she can't operate her business. Why? Now, this is insanity. This is insanity. There is nothing wrong with Kelly herself but she tells Rachel Burden of BBC Radio 5 Live that she has fallen foul of the track and trace system and not just once she's been alerted and told to isolate. This is staggering. I'm currently off on my second close contact self-isolation. My God. 
Um, so I can't even currently work at the moment. So due to go back on Friday, I'm pretty sure I'll be locked down again the same day. And when you can't go into work, how do you manage financially? I don't. Rachel Borden didn't listen to a word that Kelly just said there because that is the whole story. Kelly twice has been sent back to her house to isolate by the test and trace system. I mean, this is vaudeville, isn't it? This time? I'm currently off on my second close contact self-isolation. Um, so I can't even currently work at the moment. So due to go back on Friday, I'm pretty sure I'll be locked down again the same day. Wow. Um, Somebody tell Kelly <laughs> there is a way out of this. <laughs> this is the twilight zone. Kelly, there's a way out, love. First of all, a couple of options. One, throw your phone into the nearest river. Bit, bit drastic, bit melodramatic. Delete the NHS app from your phone, love, and disable your Bluetooth. It isn't that difficult, Kelly. And then nobody can say that they were close to you or your phone can't tell you that you were close to somebody with COVID, thus preventing you from opening your nail and, and, and beauty salon and earning a, a living. Mad stuff, right? Anyway, the presenter just doesn't pick up on it. And when you can't go into work, how do you manage financially? I don't. Um, no income. Um, I haven't had a wage since the beginning of September um, because I had to self-isolate then too. So I've been catching up since then. Um, I don't know how I'm going to come back from this one, to be fair. Can the business survive, do you think? I don't know. What did you just hear her say? What did you just hear her say? Obviously not. I don't know. I've resigned myself now. Um, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. But I think the writing's on the wall. Um, I don't think I can this time. I'm so sorry to hear that. And this is your own business, something that you've built up over the years, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, all mine. Um, but it is what it is, I think. I, I I have to stick to that thought process. I don't think my mental health could cope trying to fight it. So, I just have to go with it. You don't have to go with it. Just get rid of the app from your phone so that nobody can contact you again to say that you bumped into somebody with COVID, therefore you must isolate. Get rid of the Bluetooth. Listen! If you're listening to this and you're a new listener, a relatively new listener, you've been with the programme for a short time, delete that stuff off your phone. You'd have to be out of your mind to download that test and trace thing. Ah, what time is it? 21 minutes past the hour. Let's have a tune. Let's have a tune, dear listener. It is the Richie Allen Radio Show for Tuesday, October 20th. Live from Salford in Greater Manchester, where it's all kicking off today. Music from Bad Company. This is Can't Get Enough of Your Love. Thanks for joining me today. Lots more news coming for you between now and probably around 6.30 today. Bad Company. Can't Get Enough of Your Love on the Richie Allen Radio Show. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been holding a briefing at Downing Street. And in the last couple of minutes, he has announced Greater Manchester will enter Tier 3 from Thursday night. That's the highest level of lockdown measures. Here is Johnson speaking about three minutes ago. Art and I good with no production team. Here he is. Um, this evening, uh, informed by the data that we've just seen, I can announce that Greater Manchester will move to the very high alert level. That means that pubs and bars must close unless they're serving substantial meals. Households can't mix indoors or in most outdoor settings. In some public outdoor spaces, groups must be limited to the rule of six. And we strongly advise against travel into and out of the area. In line with the additional measures taken in Lancashire, casinos, bingo halls, betting shops, adult gaming centres and soft play areas must also close. Regulations will be laid in Parliament on Thursday and come into force uh, just after midnight. I know that these restrictions are tough, both on businesses and individuals. And believe me, no one wants to uh, be putting these things uh, into effect. Yeah, his nose grew about three inches when he said that. Boris Johnson there confirming 
Thursday at midnight, Manchester moves to Tier 3. Economic devastation on top of economic devastation. My pal Spiro Skouras is on the ball looking at this, watching this, keeping me abreast. Thank, thank you, Spiro. Check out Spiro Skouras on YouTube, activistpost.com. Tyranny. But anyway, what are you going to do? What are you going to do if they can't help themselves? If businesses won't help themselves and ignore it and open anyway, in solidarity, all of them together, hire private security teams to deal with the police. That's what you do. Don't let your life go down the toilet and the future of your children and grandchildren go into the pisser. Don't. At least stand up to it. But no, they go along with it, begging for more bailout money, which they'll have to pay back eventually, which will bankrupt us all and lead to a dystopian night. I'm not getting into it. <laughs> it's 26 minutes past five. There you are. What about Kelly and Bridge Ende? Twice I've been told to go home by Track and Trace. Mother of God. Nothing wrong with her and she might lose her hair and nail salon. I love this. Dan Wooten writes for the Sun newspaper. How could you? But he does anyway. And he also presents a program for talk radio. He got into a spat yesterday afternoon with the Labour MP Chris Bryant. It's gotten a lot of attention, so you may have heard some of it. Let's have a listen. Wales is having a fire break lockdown on Friday. A fire break lockdown. I know my accents are garbage. They all sound the same. In the final, no. Where, Wales is having a fire break lockdown, which means a national lockdown. It's shocking. Wooten, in the interview yesterday, the presenter, wants to confirm that Chris Bryant, the MP, is in favour of this fire break lockdown because he wants to prevent the NHS, the sacred NHS, from being overwhelmed. Listen, this is good. Ah! <laughs> It's not even Monday. Let's try that again. Let me remind you. The presenter wants to confirm that the MP is only in favour of the firebreak lockdown because he wants to prevent the overwhelming of the NHS. Here's the exchange. So you're saying the NHS is going to be overwhelmed. That's the argument, is it? Because I'm just trying to work out what the argument is for a total national lockdown. I don't know why you're so angry. Why is, what's, I'll tell you why I'm so angry. Down? I'm incredibly angry today, Chris. You're very perceptive to pick up on that. Yeah. I'm very angry. Yeah. Because the death figures have been released by the ONS today showing that, were, that there were 26,000 excess deaths of poor souls who died at home between March and the 11th of September because they were either too scared or not allowed to go to hospital. I passionately believe these lockdowns don't work, so I'm genuinely trying to understand I don't why you are genuinely you're doing trying. It. You're just shouting. You're just shouting. It's a, it's a really tedious way of doing radio. Well, that's your opinion. But why didn't you yeah, answer the question? Opinion. You haven't asked the question. Well, I did ask the question. Where's the proof that this is going to work? Yes, where's the proof? God damn it. God be with the days when journalists were well, preoccupied with such little things as proof. Where's the proof that by locking Wales into a national lockdown, that it's going to help and stop the cases rising? Where is the proof? Well, here's Chris Bryant with the proof. Well, it's very difficult to prove into the future. However, ah, it's very difficult to prove into the future. So we're making it up as we go along. Well, thanks for being honest anyway. Well, it's very difficult to prove into the future. However, if you... As I was trying to explain earlier, the main thing that we're trying to do in my part of the world, in South Wales, is we're trying to make sure that the NHS isn't overwhelmed. Jesus. As somebody who's had cancer in the last 18 months, I'm painfully aware of the issue you raised about what happens to people who don't go and present to their doctors because they're frightened um, uh, uh, that they might contract COVID. Um, but the, the, the other side of that problem um, and we've done very well actually locally in trying to make sure that cancer is dealt with in a, co in a completely COVID-free um, uh, setting using the private sector hospitals in Cardiff. Um, but, but the real danger is, of course, that if the NHS, if my local general hospital or the three hospitals that serve my area locally are overwhelmed and are completely full of COVID, which, is, which we're getting on for now at the moment, um, and then you try to add a little bit of flu, which normally comes at this time of year, 
there will be no space in the, ho in the hospitals to deal with any other medical condition whatsoever. So I actually, I think your argument is a false one. Um, it's, it's not a choice between these uh, trying to care for people who have other conditions as well and COVID. You have to deal with the COVID situation. Mm. You have to restrict the transmission of the virus if you're going to stand a chance of treating people for well, cancer. Look, we we disagree on this point and on that point, And there are two different schools of scientific thought. So now, this is important. The presenter introduces, importantly introduces, the fact that there are other scientists who disagree. Okay, we know this now. We don't have to name them. We know who they are. They are legion. So it's important to bring this up. Scientific thought. So it doesn't mean I'm not bright. There are, it means, there's, there's well, there are actually, science. Chris. There's one but, school of scientific thoughts, and then there's a load of crackpots on the other side. Are you joking me? So you're calling Dr. Sunitra Gupta from Oxford University a crackpot. You're calling uh, Professor Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, one of the uh, top professors of medicine in all of the world, a crackpot. I mean, this is actually offensive, Chris. You do understand that, that science has forever used uh, herd immunity in order to deal with these uh to deal but with you, these you coronaviruses i really immunity. believe i really believe you, you need to read to her, herd immunity yeah and protect protecting the vulnerable and i really think you should read and the how great do you barrington the vulnerable? just tell just take me through how you protect the vulnerable oh, there's a whole so load of, of ways infected. to do it chris chris there's a whole load of ways to do it and the great barrington declaration spells it all out but look you're a nutcase you're a complete and utter nutcase oh, chris. and you're dangerous as well chris do you know what you can go off now get rid of this man yeah, and they cut him off. The presenter told the producer to throw Chris Bryant, the MP, off the show because Bryant called him a nutcase and called him dangerous. Incredibly. Wooten, or Wooten, the presenter, cited the journalists like Sinetra Gupta and, and Kuldorf and all of these learned men and women. And the MP called him dangerous and he called those scientists crackpots. Now, Wooten left himself down badly, didn't he, by kicking him off the show. That was grandstanding, really. And he deprived himself, I think, of the opportunity to wipe the floor with Bryant. I wouldn't have kicked him off. I would have absolutely turned a screw on him and, and hammered him, giving him a chance to answer, but hammered him on his characterization of scientists as crackpots. I wouldn't have kicked him off the show. He gave him a get-out-of-jail free card by kicking him off the show. But it's incredible. These times we live in, eh? 27 and a half minutes past the air. So desperate to keep this COVID narrative on track are these people that they will go on radio shows, accuse the radio presenter of being dangerous for talking about Oxford University, Harvard University and Imperial College scientists who say we should open society up again. Lockdowns don't work. A very interesting exchange. And I'm going to say it again. He missed a real trick there by kicking Bryant off the programme. He deprived himself of an open goal. I would have played with Bryant like a cat playing with an injured mouse. I would have annihilated him. But that's just me. Not to grandstand. Not to grandstand or to make myself look good, no. But those opportunities don't come along too often. To absolutely hammer people like, uh, like Chris Bryant. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show. How are you? Nothing like it. Back with more in 60 seconds time. So I'll be... Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbyersky.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. Welcome back. Don't kill Granny. Absolutely right. Do not kill Granny. Thanks to Rick for your tweet. How you doing, Rick? Rick says, Richie, it's disturbing Bryant calling Dan Wooten crazy just because there is a difference of opinion. This is where we are with these global elite bitches. 
is actually disgusting, says Rick. Tell us what you really think, Rick. Thanks, Rick. John Stott tweets, Richie, a nice bit of theatre, which ends with Andy Burnham, perceived as a northern hero, the government getting its own way, and working class folks getting dry humped regardless. Yes. Thank you, John. That's about the size of it here in the northwest. Hi to uh, Faisal. Hi to Alan, based Ninja. How you doing? Hi to Liz Jones. Hi to Ken Kelly. How you doing, Ken? Do interact with other people on Twitter. You know how to do that by now. You know how to do that by now. Where it says search Twitter. If you put Richie Allen Show in there, press enter, all one word, and you'll see what others are tweeting the BBG. I still get emails from people asking me, what does BBG stand for? Look it up. Look it up. Hi to Ellen Wilson. How you doing, Ellen? Hi to Molly. How you doing, Molly B? Hi to Peter, John McCann. Delete that stuff off your mobile phones. Hi to Patrick Vidian. How you doing? Another Chris. How you doing, Chris? Hi to Susan. Lovely. Hi to Patricia. A lot of action on Twitter today. How you, William Henderson in Scotland? Let's uh, very quickly and very swiftly move on. Did you hear the Egypt Michal Martin, the Irish Taoiseach? He is a uh, Fianna Fáil, the Taoiseach. At least he is for a couple of years anyway, maybe less. Ireland, it was announced by Jean Ann Crowley on the radio show last night, is going to level five, the most stringent restrictions, basically a national lockdown. It's just madness. What's happening? It's not backed by any science. People are not dying. Hospitals are not overflowing. Cases are being found in the young who are asymptomatic. And even those cases being found in the young are highly dubious because the testing regime is seriously flawed. But does it matter? Here's the Egypt of the year. Michal Martin, the Irish Taoiseach, talking about if you be good, if you be good, be Jesus, we might have a nice Christmas. I understand and I feel very personally and profoundly the sense of disappointment the feelings of loneliness, perhaps even the the despair that this announcement will bring for many. If we pull together over the next six weeks, we will have the opportunity to celebrate Christmas in a meaningful way. Unbelievable. I mean, did you ever think you'd be here? You've got an absolute dipstick standing in front of a camera addressing the nation, telling the nation, if you pull together now and stay home and wreck your feckin' business, wreck your businesses, and listen now, if, you, if we pull together now and wreck our children and grandchildren's futures now, if we do all that now, right, we might have a decent Christmas now, be Jesus. Be Jesus. Shy talk. Gone bean. Amadon. Knob jockey. Well, the last one might be a bit homophobic there. You can't be saying that. When you get caught between the moon and New York City, I know it's crazy, but you might just have COVID-19. Christopher Cross. Arthur's theme singer, would you believe it? God love him. Got COVID. And apparently, wait for it, COVID paralyzed him after he got it. What kind of fuckery is this? When you get caught between the moon and New York City. I know it's crazy, but you just can't move because you have COVID and you're paralyzed. He went on to CNN. He can't ride like the wind anymore. No wind riding. For Christopher Cross, because he's paralysed. He was on CNN. He got COVID, felt a bit shitty. Then he got better. And then a few weeks later, well, it all kicked off in his body. Here he is. Can't make this up. Well, as you say, I was feeling a little bit better after three weeks. um, Feeling pretty crappy. And uh, suddenly, (laughs) my legs just gave out. And I was paralysed and couldn't walk. It was a neurological complication from Uh COVID-19. And um, I was rushed to the ICU. I was there 10 days. Uh, Fortunately, I got, you know, good treatment that kind of abated the paralysis to a degree, mostly to my waist. Uh, I did have some hand and face paralysis, but um, I was lucky in that way. Mm. I mean, so so your three weeks passed. You think that you're really getting better than this happens. This I mean, paralysis. Why do doctors believe that it was related to covid something so drastic and neurological? Good question, CNN woman. (laughs) Why does the doctor think that your respiratory infection that made you feel a bit shitty for a couple of weeks made you paralyzed? Christopher, back to you. Well, um, I did a test for it, but, you know, they're convinced it was from COVID because what's wrong with me is 
is accessed through a, a viral infection, which COVID is. So I was only the second person in the world to have this happen, but since there have been many. And- second person in the world to have this happen, but since there have been many sources, Christopher, no. And typically it's only one in 100,000. So It's only one in 100,000 to get paralyzed from COVID. They know it's from that and it was just a, a, a complication, which there are a lot of uh, with COVID that people don't realize. And that's kind of why I'm so pleased to talk to you to warn people that they got to be careful. This, this could happen to you. Ah, Jesus, huh? Wear your masks, people. Stay as far apart as you can. Wash your feckin' hands or you'll end up like Chris. Paralyzed by COVID. How long will this last, Christopher? This slight paralysis? Well, there's no way to know, Aaron. I think they say nine months to a year, I should, whatever, however much healing I'll I'll have, I will. But I could just be like this forever. Um, You know, back when I had it in March, of course, we had no, we have knowing. I I was on a trip. No one wore masks. No one had masks on the plane. The administration just didn't tell us about it. So I didn't know. And now we know. And so... Again, that's the, 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 the good news that people can do something about it. But I have no idea. They don't really expect me to heal completely. Um, I hope to do better than I am. But, you know, I'm, uh, I'm able to walk with a cane and I can at least live my life. And I'm very fortunate compared to so many. What do you mean you're fortunate compared to so many? Nobody else was paralyzed by COVID, you muppet. That's an infomercial, that. Christopher. You're not famous anymore. Nobody's buying your records. Go on telly and say COVID paralyzed you and we'll let you support Oreo Speedwagon next summer. Get your career back on track. And I can't fight this feeling anymore. Chris Cross. Christopher Cross on the Richie Allen Radio Show. Asher, why not? Let's have a blast of this. It's the BBG, not the BBC. Live from Salford, the Richie Allen Radio Show. Lovely to be with you. Tuesday's programme. Christopher Cross back with more news after this classic classic Christopher Cross who was paralysed by COVID-19 get well soon Christopher (laughs) I'm the biggest child that ever lived I make no excuses for it I've always been like this I'm never going to change I'm never going to change let's hear more from Boris Johnson's number 10 Downing Street briefing you know this guy, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer? You know this guy, don't you? What's his name? Jon- Jonathan Van Tam. That's the-, that's the guy. That's the guy. John Claude Van Tam. Yeah, this agent was speaking around about the same time as Boris Johnson today. And he says that coronavirus infections are seeding from younger age groups and are penetrating older age groups as we progress forward. The horse shit and the scare and fear mongering knows no limit. It is scandalous that we're putting up with this, isn't it? Isn't it? And there's no opposition to it. Here's Jonathan Van Tan. All right, all right, all right. Enough of that shit. (laughs) Here Here he is. It's seeding from the old to the young. But the other half of the coin, if you like, are the older age groups from um, 30 to 39 through to 80 plus. And here you can see over time this continuing increase in case rates. Mm -hmm. And this really shows us now that um, the infections which have seeded in the younger age groups are now penetrating those older age groups as we go forwards in time. As we go forwards in time, coronavirus infections are seeding from younger age groups to the older people. We're killing granny. And these are cases. This means Cases, which means what? means that the hospital admissions and the deaths, sadly, that are linked to those cases are now baked in for the next two to three weeks. Baked in. Next slide, please. Next slide. Baked in. What does that mean? They're baked in to the statistics. Garbage. John Jonathan Van Tam there, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. 13 minutes to the top of the air. It's the Richie Allen Radio Show flying solo today. Lots of guests tomorrow. Lots of guests on Thursday. But today I fancy just a chat with you. Because I love you. I thought today I'll just chat to you. And I'll work like an absolute dog to put together this programme, which I've done today just for you. Chris Cross. Kay Burley. A Dr. Alex George on the telly this morning. 
young, good-looking doctor. Kay gets excited when he's on because he was on Love Island, Celebrity Love Island or Love Island. And on the mornings when Dr. Alex George is on with Kay, the producers have extra pairs of undercrackers on standby because Kay hots up, doesn't she? Fabulous. It's all good. <laughs> it's good. Today, Kay must have got cracked upside the head on the way to work because she forgot that she's an apologist for the government and its science advisors. And briefly, for a minute, Kay Burley became a journalist again. Have a listen. Something that struck me yesterday, Doctor, perhaps you could uh, advise, um, could potentially be asymptomatic as far as COVID-19 is concerned because 80% of people are, I believe. Um, what about if you're going to have a flu jab? Could that potentially then make it worse? Okay. Will you marry me? Great question. You're asymptomatic. You're asymptomatic. Allegedly, you've got coronavirus, but you're not sick. There's nothing wrong with you. Could getting the flu jab fuck you right up? Asks Kay Burley. Will young Dr. Alex George know the answer? He's a bit flummoxed. Of, uh, the, the COVID-19 make, make, will infect you, you, you initially, um, He knows exactly what he was asked. He's buying time while his brain works, well, whatever kind of a brain he has, at a thousand miles an hour to come up with a bullshit answer. Um, asymptomatic, but then potentially your COVID-19 symptoms could come out more because you've had your flu vaccine, which um, could, could uh, trigger that. I'm sexually aroused, Kay. I really am. There's no reason that should that should be um, the case. I mean, flu, uh, they're both respiratory uh, viruses, and of course, the the flu vaccine is is not a not a live flu uh, virus. But if you compare this kind of symptoms, because I'd stop him there. Sorry, doctor, you're trailing off there and not making any sense. Answer the question. Because it does cause a lot of confusion. Um, they can be very similar between flu and. Uh, COVID-19, the idea of having fevers particularly can confuse people. So being very careful to self-isolate and have any symptoms is the main kind of advice there. But no, it shouldn't It shouldn't trigger uh, It shouldn't um, COVID symptoms or things that would confuse from that. But as always, look, if you're worried about it, if you're displaying any of the symptoms we talk about, then self-isolate and get a test. Be safe. Yeah. So he didn't answer her question. It shouldn't screw you over and make you sick. Brilliant stuff, Kay. Somebody must have cracked Kay upside the head and she forgot that she was um, an apologist like her fellow journalists, allegedly, at Sky News who apologise for the government and don't question people. Good job, Kay. Then Kay asks young Dr. Alex about his mental health because we're all obsessed these days with her mental health. Here we go. Mm. Um, and just she didn't sound too convinced there, did she, Kay? Well done, Kay. <laughs> that was quite good, Kay. Talk about then self-isolate and get a test. Be safe. Mm. Mm, good girl. Um, and just before we let you go, we always like to check in on you. Are you really doing okay? I am, thank you. I'm very pleased you're doing that. You're doing the ask twice, Kay, which I, I'm really, I'm really glad about. And I hope people watching might take from that as well. You know, to ask someone twice is really important. And yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm getting there. There's up and down days, but um, it's lovely to speak with you. And it was innocent possible way. It's lovely to wake up with Kay in the morning. Hey, that's nice. It's nice to talk to you, Doctor. Thanks very much. You do seem uh, a lot happier uh, this week. It's good to talk to you. Thank you. Change of undercrackers Thank needed you. immediately. I told you Kay gets excited. Seconds later. Bye. Thank you. Dr. Alex wakes up with me. Na, 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 na. Quick look at the weather, Isabel. Try and follow that if you can. Yeah, in the most innocent ways as well. I think I'm in love with him. Mother of Jesus, huh? All righty. Shall we move on? Oh, there was a bit more amusement from Kay. I love the Ginger Ninja and her pals. Keeping it real over at Sky Central. Na, 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 na. Brilliant, Kay. A few minutes later, Kay said this. This is proper. Be well, it's belly laughs for me because I've got a fairly warped sense of humour. Kay was going to interview Roger Black, the former Olympic silver medalist in the 400 metres. And Kay said this. Now, many of us, um, a friend of mine described lockdown. Um, we all come out of it in, in one of three ways. A hunk, a drunk or a chunk. What? <laughs> Let's hear that again. Now, many of us, um, a friend of mine described lockdown. Um, we all come out of it in, in one of three ways. A hunk, a drunk or a chunk. What kind of fuckery? Right, OK. You come out of lockdown as a hunk, a drunk or a chunk. 
Which one are you certain? Well, I'm a hunk. I've put on a few pounds. Uh, let's talk to someone who perhaps... She has. She has an arse. You could park a bike in now, Kay. Perhaps can advise us on how to... Su- anyway, let's leave, Kay. It's seven and a half minutes to the top of the air. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Flying solo today. Tis myself. Are you well? Shall we move on or shall we have another tune? What do you think? Shall we have another tune? This is for Chris, because he asked me nicely. Chris, just for you. The Vapors and turning Japanese on your Richie Allen show. The Vapors on your Richie Allen radio show. Hi to Natalie Stacey. How you doing, Natalie? Great to hear from you this afternoon. Great tune, that, eh? Great tune. I remember when I first heard that tune. I was in high school and it had been out a few years by the time I heard it, but I played it to death. Great tune. It's coming up for three minutes to the top of the hour. Tuesday's programme. Me and you today. Me and you. Spoiled with guests. Spoiled. Hi to Alex Forsyth, who's been listening to the programme for the, for the last few weeks. Slice of normal in a world gone mad. Thanks, Alex. Welcome to the program. And if you are finding, or if you have found your way to the Big Baldy Gammons radio show, thanks for finding it. Stay around. You'll hear some things you won't like, but don't panic. You'll hear some things you like as well. This program is live Monday to Thursday at 5 o'clock UK time, 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and it's archived lots of places, Spotify, iTunes, Podomatic.com, and of course, it's on the TuneIn app, at least for now anyway, and at least for now, it's on YouTube as well. Shall we move on? I think I'll be with you till around about 6.30, 6.40. I'm not sure. I don't time these things. Richard Hatchett, Dickie Hatchett, Dickie Hatchett. Richard Hatchett is the CEO of CEPI. Do you know what CEPI is? I know you do, because you're not thick. I know you do. CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, founded by, co-founded by, and funded by Bill and Melinda Gates. Is anybody starting to wonder, is Melinda Gates the evil one? It's a court to me, especially the last few days. You never hear of Melinda. She's never on the telly, never on the radio. Is Melinda the evil queen, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, Richard Hatchett, the CEO of CEPI, co-founded by the, Cl- by the Gates, I'm sure the Clintons have something to do with it. Bill and Melinda Gates. He spoke today to Lionel Barber, host of the What Next podcast on LBC about vaccines. And when will we have the bloody vaccine? I I will say that I I think that vaccines will begin to become available uh, in in the first half of the year. I think the supply of vaccine is is not going to equal the, the... you know, potential demand for the vaccine in all of next year. Um, and so the, the vaccine will have to be prioritized for specific populations. And I think those, I think most countries um, will prioritize vaccine for those at greatest risk. That, so that's going to be a very, uh, that's going to be a very tough political decision. Who gets the virus and who doesn't? You know, I, I would, I would hope that it's a dis- What did the host of the program just say there? I think it was a mistake, but it's always fun to listen back. Risk. That, so, that's going to be a yeah. very, that's going to be a very tough political decision. Who gets the virus and who doesn't? Who gets the virus and who doesn't? Yeah, it's a slip of the tongue. Or is it? Or is it? Wink, wink. Anyway, he meant vaccine. Who gets the vaccine and who doesn't? Dickie Hatchet of CEPI. Dickie Hatchet, who gets it? You know, I, I would I would hope that it's a decision that societies uh, and communities can come to some consensus about. Right. Societies and communities need to come to a consensus about how do we decide who gets the vaccine? Because the vaccine is going to be in such great demand, it'll be like one of those Christmas toys over the years. Remember, this year it's the PlayStation 5, as far as I know anyway. Go back through the toys of Christmas past. Lolo balls. Remember that? Remember when Lolo balls were all the rage? A ball that looked like the planet Jupiter... I think, with a plastic circumference that you stood on and hopped around like a feckin' Egypt, a total feckin' Egypt, oblivious to how stupid you looked because everybody else had one. Remember the Lolo ball hopping around like a Muppet? Yeah, you do. You had one. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Then we had to be politically correct and call them Hero Turtles. Cabbage Patch Kids, G.I. Joe with a Kung Fu grip. 
all these things. The vaccine is going to be like that. Everyone will want it. Like that Van Halen song, Everybody Wants Some. Nothing like this vaccine. The plebs, the unwashed, will kill themselves to get it. They will. So what do we do? How do we reach consensus? Asked Dickie Hatchett from CEPI. I think we should bring some of our favourite game shows back, dear listener. Why not? This is so feckin' crazy. This nightmarish, dystopian paradigm. Let's bring back some of our favourite game shows and get complete arseholes on there. Josephine and Joe Bloggs, get them onto the Generation Game or play your cards right to compete for the vaccine. But we can't do that because Bruce Foresight is dead, thank God. But, but Jim Bowen is still alive. At least I think he is. Jim Bowen. Let's get Bullseye back on telly. The Darts Game Show, our American listeners now, haven't a Scooby-Doo what I'm talking about. Bullseye? Jim Bowen? What's he talking about? It was a game show where you threw darts for prizes. And it was the best game show ever. You can stick your classic concentration and Alex Trebek and Jeopardy up your arse. We had Jim Bowen over here on this side of the pond. Yanks, Jim Bowen. Let's get Jim Bowen back on telly And if we don't know how to distribute the vaccine, and if everybody wants it, let's get people throwing throwing darts for for the vaccine. Yes. Yes. It's the vaccine. Oh, God be with the day. If you remember this on ITV Sundays at half five, or was it six? Half five, was it? Answer me. Was it half five or six? I can't remember. Come on. It's the and here's your host, Jim Bowen. Yes, there's Jim Bowen, the greatest game show presenter of all time. You can stick your Alex Trebek up your backside. And that other guy, Bob, Bob Eubanks. Bob Eubanks, that's the one. I bet you my American listeners are impressed now with my knowledge of their game show hosts. Yeah. Now you can play darts for the vaccine. But you can't just have them throwing darts with the vaccine. It's a 30-minute show. You've got to fill it. So you've got them to win some prizes on Bully's prize board so that they can win toasters and microwave ovens and, 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 and exercise bikes and stereos and, I don't know, a scale extric or something, right? So you've got a heap of prizes. And then, with an armful of prizes, you ask them to gamble those prizes against what's behind Bully's prize board And that's the vaccine, right? 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 You get this, you do. You're following. So if they've got a load of prizes, and then you say, do you want to gamble the prizes against the possibility of getting the vaccine? It's these prizes you've now got to think about. Come on. You've got to decide whether you want to gamble all those prizes against tonight's star prize, which is hiding behind Bully. 101 or more with six darts. Non-dart player to go first. And you've got the time it takes the board to revolve to tell us what you'd like to do. Audience, what would you do? Vaccine! Vaccine! You're going to give it a try. Well, you're playing so well. Yes. non doubt player first. We wish Get him to have a go. 101 and 6 starts for the vaccine and... For tonight's star prize and everything. 10. 10. <laughs> That's thinking about it. The one tonight! Yes! Fantastic. They've won a lifetime supply of the COVID-19 vaccine for all of the family. Wonderful. What kind of fuckery is this? Well, if you can't figure out how to distribute the vaccine, apparently Jim Bowen is dead, by the way. That's just pissed all over my gag. (laughs) Jim Bowen. Rest in peace, Jim Bowen. Where was I when Jim Bowen died? Anyway, back to uh, Dickie Hatchett of CEPI, the CEO, Richard Hatchett. He was talking there about, well, how do we figure out how to distribute the vaccine? Where do we get consensus and all of that sort of thing? Back to him, uh, speaking to Lionel Barber of LBC's What Next about this vaccine. I mean, the, the impact of the virus on the, on, the, on the young, on children, is very, very small. Um, you know, the mortality rate in those who are over the age of 70, over the age of 80, you know, in, over the age of 80, I think it exceeds... 10%, maybe 15%. And, and This is some line now. And I'm, I'm amazed that the LBC guy didn't catch him out. He said the mortality rate 
in basically he said the mortality rate of COVID in uh, those between 70 and 80 and over 80 is between 10 and 15 percent. It's actually a lot less than that, even though, even though the average age of somebody dying with COVID is 82. It doesn't mean the 10 to 15 percent of people over 70 who get COVID die. That's actually not true. It's less than that. And those who are over the age of 70, over the age of 80, you know, in over the age of 80, I think it exceeds 10 percent, maybe 15 percent. And and so, the the you know, I think when you have a, a scarce resource and a life saving resource, I think you want to allocate that resource to do the most good. And yeah, I- give it to people in care homes and finish them off. Why don't you? Kay Birdie's a genius. Kay, okay. She was on the case earlier on. If you start going into care homes and not only giving that vaccine to care home staff, but if you start giving it to people in their late 70s or 80s, many of them are going to get ill. In my opinion, that's an opinion. That isn't a fact. It's an opinion. We've got to say there is a difference. Seven minutes past the hour. That was Richard Hatchett, the CEO of CEPI. CEO of CEPI. All right, we'll have another tune then and we'll crack right on. I think I'm going to be with you till around 6.30 today. Time for some Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye, eh? And sexual healing. Thinking about Kay Burley, to be honest. Marvin Gaye on the Richie Allen radio show, Sexual Healing. Good catch by my mate Spiro there. He's tweeted out a link to an old clip of Ted Turner, CNN, talking about, ultimately about changing the way we create energy and use energy. He's talking about climate change. And uh, as Spiro says in the tweet, Turner lets the cat out of the bag. It's a very timely bit of audio. Let's hear a bit of it. Ted Turner, CNN. Remind me when this was actually recorded. It is a few years ago. This is how important it is and and how... How, how important that we do it quickly. We have to mobilize the same way we did when we entered World War II in 1941. We have to fully mobilize everything we have and put it into changing the energy system over. And not just here in the United States, but all over the world. It's going to be the business, business, biggest business project in the history of the world. Fortunes, billions of dollars are going to be made. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to be employed. We're going to have clean air. We're going to have so many benefits from it. It's not going to cost us anything it, once we get going with it. It's not going to cost us anything. Only the people that don't, un, don't understand it think it's going to. It, it, not doing it will be catastrophic. We'll have eight degrees. We'll be eight degrees hotter in 10, not 10, but in 30 or 40 years. And basically none of the crops will grow. Most of the people will have died and the rest of us will be cannibals. Civilization will have broken down. What The few people that are left will be living in a, in, in a failed state like Somalia or Sudan, and, and living conditions will be intolerable. The droughts will be so bad, there'll be no more corn growing. It, it will, the, the, not doing it is suicide, just like dropping bombs on each other, nuclear weapons is suicide. So we've got to stop doing the two suicidal things, which are nuclear hanging on to our and, nuclear and, weapons. And global and, and then after that, we've got to, we've got to, Stabilize the population. When I was born, no, there were so too, what's wrong with the population? I mean, with too many people. Too many people. <laughs> Ted Turner is a guy. He owns a news network, and he's on. I think it's Charlie Rose he's speaking with, and that's the greatest pile of horse manure you'll ever hear in your entire life. Talk about fear mongering, and I think he shared that uh, a clip uh, that Spiro Skouras was a journalist because that hasn't changed. In fact, it's gotten worse, and you hear this on a daily basis on our national news channels, if it isn't journalists, it's their guests, basically propagating this fear campaign. Fear, fear, fear about COVID, about deaths, about deaths, about overwhelming the NHS, about the collapse of civilization if we don't deal with uh, coronavirus. Amazing, huh? Ted Turner there, yeah. A lot I could say about Ted Turner. I know all about him and the media and what's happened to the media in the last 35, 40 years. Hi to Winston. How you doing, Winston? Who's playing darts in the shed while listening to me. And then I went and played the old bullseye theme tune. I'm good at that. I didn't know that Jim Bowen had died. So Jim Bowen has gone to that great game show in the sky with Bruce Forsyth and, and others. Lord rest him. I didn't know that, Jim. Yeah, Jim was so bad he was good. 
rated as one of the worst television presenters of all time. But he kept his gig for years and years and years. He's got a stand-up comic who became a game show host. Nearly quarter past six then. Let's talk about something that's not so funny, but is interesting. And it's about bottle-fed babies. Now, I happened to catch this on BBC Two this morning. I was watching Victoria Darbyshire. She's a good presenter. And she was talking about how bottle-fed babies are swallowing millions of microplastic particles every day. How do we know that? Well, scientists have been looking into it and they are wondering about the effect of human exposure to tiny plastics. What might it mean for people? Scientists, according to the BBC, found that the recommended high temperature process for sterilising plastic bottles and preparing formula milk caused bottles to shed millions of microplastics and trillions of even smaller nanoplastics, polypropylene. That's I what is that it? The bottles are made of polypropylene, yeah, uh, and they make up eighty two percent of the world market. Glass bottles are the main alternative, but over eight out of ten bottles are polypropylene, and when you heat them up at the desired temperature, releases millions of microplastics and trillions of even smaller nanoplastics. Is it having having an effect on children? Is it? Don't know. Maybe John Boland from Trinity College, Dublin, is the main man here, speaking to Victoria Derbyshire about this. Here's John Boland. And if you have a young baby and you use formula, you really need to listen to this. Yes, well, um, as you said, uh, we looked at plastic infant feeding bottles and 82% of the world infant feeding bottles are actually plastic. And we identified products from 10 different vendors, which constituted 68% of that market. And so we did. We went through the normal WHO protocols. We sterilized the bottles. We then um, um, filled them with, with 70 degrees centigrade water. We added the powdered milk. We shocked them. We put the cap on. Um, and then we, we measured the uh, amount of microplastics that were in the formula. And what we found was that um, on average, you have at least one million, and in many cases, several million microplastics per liter of the actual volume. Um, and actually, we, what we found was even if you use cold water, if you shake the bottle for, for one minute, as recommended by the WHO, you still produce hundreds of thousands of microplastics. OK, so anyone who's bottle fed their baby or who is doing that right now will, will feel very alarmed by what you have just said. Should they be? Yeah, well, I mean, we were alarmed. I mean, actually, when you think of microplastics, you, you think of them coming indirectly into your food, maybe through the waterways and then into fish. But here we have waterways, we have um, microplastics showing up directly in the prepared food. Um, the reality is we don't know of any adverse health effects from exposure to microplastics. Okay. So there hasn't been many studies. There have been some studies in animals, but the bottom line is the jury's still out. The jury's still out, he said. He's being honest. He said he, said he doesn't know. There haven't been too many studies done on it. Victoria Derbyshire is a very good presenter. She asks a good question here. She says, well, haven't we been using these bottles for years? Good question. Millions uh, of people will have been bottle fed through plastic bottles um, using normal sterilisation techniques and not particularly mitigating it, you know, the, the microplastics and, and have turned out all right. And there's been no health problems. Absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, let's be unclear about this. I mean, as humans, we're, we, we ingest and inhale vast quantities of particles. Mm. And our as humans, we ingest and inhale vast quantities of particles. We do indeed. I wonder, does he even know the half of it? Our body's job is to excre excrete these particles. Um, and so it isn't generally a problem. M my concern and the concern of my colleagues is that we are concerned about the potential exposure of young infants with developing immune systems. Most studies that have been done have been done on adult mice and whatnot. And the reality is that we haven't done studies at the appropriate level. And so for us, it's about the cautionary principle until we have technologies that mitigate against release. Until we have technologies that mitigate against release. That's very good. And he said, we haven't, while we've looked at adult mice, we haven't looked at babies with developing, obviously, immune systems and the impact of inhaling, well, not inhaling, drinking, these microplastics and microparticles. This is important stuff, this. Right, very good. 
And uh, that was on Victoria Derbyshire today. So if you have a young child, maybe you need to know that. Maybe the smartest thing to do if you're not breastfeeding is to use the glass bottle. Maybe. I don't know. Many of you will tweet me undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, unfailingly, you'll tweet me to say, Richie, mums should be breastfe- breastfisting. Jesus. Breastfeeding. That was a Freudian slip. Breastfeeding where possible because babies build up a more robust immune system if they are um, breastfeeding, effectively. Yes, nursing. Nursing is the word I was looking for. Nursing, exactly. Maybe I should do a campaign. The Richie Allen Show has never ran a campaign because you can't be a journalist and an activist. It's an oxymoron. When you hear people saying, activist journalist, that's an oxymoron. You're either a journalist or you're not. But everybody is doing it. Sky News are running this anti-plastic in the ocean campaign and lots of other shows are doing their own campaigns. So I'm going to run a campaign to get people breastfeeding again. Why not? Let's do a campaign to get people breastfeeding, to get women, to get people. Jesus, I'm sounding very woke. Only women, real women, can breastfeed, of course. So we need a slogan for it. We need a slogan, we need some artwork, we need a slogan. I've got the slogan, I think. Get your tits out, get your tits out, get your tits out for the lads. Right, that's the slogan. It's very catchy. I know, I told you this is the level. I've been telling you this for years. Absolute garbage. Right, okay. A number of you have been tweeting me today, having listened very closely to the great Jean Ann Crowley last night. Mentioned this at the very beginning of the programme, if you're joining me late. She had a uh, a shed load of correspondence. The wonderful thespian, journalist, great human being and great, great friend of mine and my better half was on with me last night to talk about quite a few things but one was the was the idea for a pamphlet or a little book that would be titled, a working title something along the lines of A Beginner's Guide to the New World Order. Jean Anne gave out the email address and she was inundated overnight by what she said were, were some amazing emails. And she's thrilled to bits about that. So there you go. But a number of you were talking today about the difficulties broaching the subject with people because of, well, people's, I don't know, tendency to be obtuse about it and all that. You know, about the coronavirus and about the other experts and about the data and all of that. I listen to most of the national radio stations. I flick around in the mornings as I am preparing this programme. And mask abuse is getting more common. Now, this is true. There was a woman pictured, filmed, headbutting another woman. Yes, at a supermarket in somewhere, I can't remember, somewhere down south the other day. And some of you said, oh, that's fake. They want to scare people into wearing the masks. It didn't look fake to me. I don't understand why some people say everything is fake. I have witnessed on two occasions nasty scenes like that. One was where, as I mentioned before, a guy started screaming at me in a record shop to wear a mask. And when I was in a supermarket around Salford a couple of weeks back, I saw two blokes in a very heated conversation, which didn't come to blows, but it wasn't far away. It's madness what's going on. People are terrified. And I was saying to Jean Anne, this morning, we had a brief telephone call this morning. And I said to her, I'm beginning to get very spooked by those in total compliance. They're spooking me. The ones that are in total and utter thrall, they are in thrall to the government and to the idea that they are, they are in danger of losing their lives to this thing, which of course they're not. They're beginning to scare the granny out of me now. And I'm not just saying that, and I don't want you to be scared, but I don't like being around these people. I get twitchy. I can imagine it's like being a dog. You know, being a dog, and you're out and about, and you sense fear in another dog, or you sense fear in another person, and it makes you uneasy. It's making me incredibly uneasy. I'm not having a mental health crisis, but it is. Nick Ferrari on LBC this morning, he was speaking to his audience. He opened the phones and Sarah from Lambeth 
told him this and this isn't funny and it's becoming very common uh yes i've had a few uh, recently two um occasions where i was shouted at and sort of made to feel really ridiculous for uh, I, what in my opinion wasn't a massive trans- transgression but right. um i was i went for a run with a friend of mine and then went into a coffee shop and i didn't have my mask so i tied my running shirt around my face completely sort of quite tight and just stood in the line about two meters away from an, a, a gentleman who was probably in his mid-70s. Right. And he turned around and shouted at me to step away first oh, and then said I wasn't wearing an appropriate um, face covering. I wasn't wearing a mask. Yes, yeah, st- step away first is becoming very common. That's been said to me a couple of times lately. Step away. I went to the chemist to pick up my inhaler only a couple of days back and I was nowhere near the person at the counter. But she turned around and told me to keep me distance. You, you can imagine, because we've known each other now quite a long time. I'm, I'm not a grandstander. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a diva. And I'm not a thug. But you can imagine what I thought about saying to her. Keep your distance. I have a short temper. But I didn't say anything. I ignored her. Keep your distance. Wear your mask. These people are scaring me. What do you do with these people? Oh, boy. And I was with a friend of mine whose husband is a barrister, and she said, well, I'm going to call my husband and find out what the actual legal requirements are, because it should just be a face covering, not a mask. Right, right. And, um, and what did... What, but I, I, my understanding is as long as you... It, it can be a T-shirt. As long as, long as you're wearing it correctly, um, it's fine, isn't it? I've seen people yeah, wearing scarves. It was, over my, it was over my nose. It was over my face. It was, it was really just what I've seen, and this is now about... This, I, I then had it again yesterday, picking my daughter up for, from school, which you could argue I was in the wrong in this instance. But I picked up my phone while I was picking her up, and uh. in the front courtyard, you have to have your mask on, which is completely fine. I've always done it. When I don't have it, I, I stay outside of the school courtyard. But this time, I picked up the phone, completely forgot, and pulled my mask below my nose. And a uh, father at the school shouted at me, it just it really loudly, put your mask on. Right. And... I just find it, I mean, it's the second time in quite a short period of time, and I just find it a bit of a power trip, really. Yeah, I think in some people they probably are, Sarah, look after you, so keep a mask by your side. Keep a mask by your side, then, says Nick Ferrari. What an arse. I don't know if it's a power trip. I, I, I don't know. It's a bit simplistic to reach the conclusion that the people screaming about putting masks on are on a power trip. Maybe one or two of them are. Maybe... Maybe a lot of them are genuinely terrified of getting the virus. And they believe the lies they've been told by their government. They believe that it is very possible that they might end up in a hospital bed with a ventilator shoved down their throat, maybe. Maybe they believe it. And if they do, that's a fairly sobering thought, isn't it? To be lying on your back with one of those horrible things wedged down your, uh, your, your throat. So I don't know what's going on, but they're spooking me, people. Their inability to see through it. We heard this at the top of the programme. You know, it's a bit of Stockholm Syndrome going on when you've got Greater Manchester businessmen and women thanking Andy Burnham. Jesus wept like. Burnham wants to saddle you with unmanageable levels of debt while you're kept away from your business. Burnham should be saying, get back to work. Open your doors. Public, go back, go down. Grannies, granddads, take loads of vitamin D3. Wrap up well. Make sure your home is properly ventilated. You need ventilation, people. That's one thing they never talk about with senior citizens. They never do it, ever. Why do you think they don't do it? I've spoken over the years to older doctors on this programme, not about COVID, but about general well-being and health and the amount of old-school senior doctors who said to me, Richie, when you get to a certain age, you might be freezing, but get that big sweatshirt on you and ventilate your feckin' home. You've got to do that. By all means, have the central gas heating on, but you've got to ventilate the fecker. It's good for you. They don't say that. I say it to older people. The last thing in the world I want is for you to get sick, let alone die. Do anything to keep you well. Take vitamin D3 daily. Take vitamin C daily. Get outside your effing house. 
And if you're struggling to walk, get a walking frame or get a wheelchair. Wrap up and get out in the fresh air. You can't be locked indoors. That's how you look after old people. But Burnham is saying, no, we want more money from the government to keep people locked in. As you know, the big story in terms of the UK media this afternoon is that the government didn't reach an agreement with Greater Manchester mayors and mayoresses. There's one mayoress in Stockport. So therefore, Boris Johnson announced, and I played the clip earlier, that Manchester from midnight moves into tier three. As the great Jean Ann Crowley said to us last night while it was happening, Ireland has gone to level five. That's just devastating for Ireland. And in Wales, they've gone to what they're calling the fire break. Jesus wept. And that begins on Friday. Folks, ladies, gentlemen, that's it for me today. Thank you. That's been an entertaining 90 minutes, if I do say so myself. Self-praise is no praise. I've enjoyed that. I hope you have as well. Plenty of guests coming up on tomorrow's show, Wednesday and Thursday. I will, I swear to God and to Sonny Jesus, have a phone-in program next week for you. I really will. Next week. We'll have a phone-in and you can vent your spleen on the airwaves of the RA show again. Thanks for listening today. Do share this when it's uh, on the usual channels shortly, about a half an hour or thereabouts. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Speak to you again tomorrow at five o'clock UK time. Until then, you do take care of yourselves and one another. And we're leaving with Jackson Brown today. One of my favourite songs of all time. What a tune this is. See you tomorrow.